Hi, welcome back to the One in Twenty Show. I'm really excited to be back today because I'm joined by Luis. Hello. Agnes. Nice to have you Thank on the you. show. We've had a lot going on recently. It's exciting because every day we grow. And as you've been seeing, there's been a lot of things that have continued to develop, um, whether it's for us getting guests on the show and people who reflect the mission statement. And that is why I'm really excited to have you on today, Luis. Um, there's been so much that we've been learning from so many different people that you've been seeing come on the show. And more recently, we had Stephen Whalen on the show and Blake Robbins and a bunch of now adults, you know, in a sense, we're still kind of kids going at this whole thing. But it's neat to start affirming the things that are, you know, unquestion, you know, questionable things in this world and um, to have adults that kind of reflect that. So, Luis, welcome to the show. I'm very ha happy to have you on, and I'm excited to get into it. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, what's some background on everything that you do in the arts? What do you do in the arts for everybody who doesn't know? And just go for it, right into it. Sure. Um, so I am heavily involved in the charter school movement in New York City. I, uh, right now, I develop and work with arts departments and programs within our schools. Uh, we have 17 charter schools across the country, and I oversee all of the speech and debate and arts programs in each of the schools. Uh, I've been in that movement for 25 years now, working in the public school system, uh, really serving more of underserved youth, um, low-income youth, uh, in communities that are um, Title One, they call it, which mm -hmm. means that they just they don't serve a certain amount of um, uh, the, the 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 income in the area. It's kind of one of the poorest in the congressional districts in the country. So we start schools in those communities uh, that are geared towards bridging the success rate of going to college and. Uh, getting degrees um, a lot of the schools the communities that we work in the dropout rates 50 or 60 percent of the kids will not graduate high school due to the hardships and the resources that they do not have mm -hmm. so there's just a group of passionate adults who come together and so that's what I do for my living which I have been um, doing and and serving for my entire uh, <laughs> creative self for the last 25 years and through that uh, we started a theater company, uh, felt there was a need for a theater company mm -hmm. in our community. And so um, that's now the next phase of my work is mm -hmm. bridging opportunity through theater. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that's Open Hydrant Theater. Yes. The name of the company. In Hunts Point, the Bronx. Wonderful. So, so cool to, you know, be able to have so much of your life be dedicated to that. Like in a sense, your whole life has been in service to that, the community. And that's so cool as an artist because, you know, everything an artist does is not necessarily in tuned with yeah. the rest of society. Yeah. How has uh, starting Open Hydrant and getting into, you know, into the Bronx and having these kids come into your program, how has that grown you as an artist as well as, you know, help the community at large around you? Uh, for me, I, I just as an artist, and I think there's a difference from you know people who are who are, are artistic and people who are artists. And I think that I really, as what I teach my students, you know, what is it that you're leaving behind? Like, what is the legacy? What is the you know? What does Hamilton say? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I know <laughs> what, what you're saying. It? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, who's gonna there's tell so your many story, of them. Yeah, you know? tell your story. Who's yeah. gonna tell your story? Right. Um, I can quote so many Hamilton things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, the, to me, it's, as an artist, I wanted to make sure that, first of all, I always wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be a, a performer. I wanted to be mm -hmm. creative in some way. I found that um, there's so many roads you can take, but in the end, I had to ask myself why I wanted to be. It's just, you know, anyone can, you know, pick up a violin and, say I can play it but mm. did you really train did you learn so the reality was what was it that I was doing this for and I I, it, I thought maybe I wanted to be a performer I thought maybe I wanted to be a singer maybe I wanted to be a director maybe I wanted to be a photographer I was like I want to be everything and I realized I needed to really focus on what that really meant for me and I just found that for me teachers were really important and I knew that I 
I really wanted to use my art in some way and I didn't like auditioning. I didn't like being mm -hmm. rejected and it really hurt. And especially when you come from a background or a family that rejects you for wanting to be an artist. So it's just on top of that, now the industry is rejecting you and every time they say no, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that maybe that wasn't the road for me, but what could I do to be creative? And that's how I decided that I wanted to really work on serving because I knew that I could give because a teacher really helped me and I thought that you know there was just a need for teachers that truly wanted to bridge more opportunity and I've always just been a, a I believe that what is it you're leaving behind and I wanted to be able to stand for something I wanted to be able to know that when I moved on to the next part of my uh my existence that there was a stamp of some sort that was me mm. and I felt that I could really do that by looking into this industry and wondering what is it lacking what's mm. not there mm. you know you would think that in New York City there's every possible theater experience or theater you know organization that there could be and then you realize it's not true we're, we're, we there's still uh, underserved theatrical communities and in New York City, the theater capital of the world. So I knew, okay, let's go somewhere and start bridging and building something that I knew could be historic, that I knew would 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 be needed. And I knew that if we could do it, if we could actually create something in this community, that then we would be doing something that would be legacy oriented, that mm. would be something that you would be remembered for doing so that when you are, you know, dust in the wind, <laughs> there's still you there which is what I envy so much about the greatest artists, the greatest performers and singers and dancers is that once they're gone, they're still there. Mm. And so I wanted to build something like that. And that's really where it came from and where it started. Wonderful. And isn't that, I mean, that is so true. What you just hit on right there is there's so many people. And I mean, somebody modern who you've already mentioned, Miranda, mm -hmm. who comes in and says, I don't care what you think. I'm going to make two music musicals about me. Deeply. I mean, Hamilton's rooted in history, but it's him. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't care, but he learned it from Sondheim. Mm -hmm. And Sondheim learned it from people like Stravinsky and people way back. Mm -hmm. And that's so, like, it's so empowering to think that you have the opportunity, if you work hard enough and you make it your life, to be able to make an impact, right? Isn't that what New York's about? Yeah. I, I really, you'd be amazed in New York also. You know, there's what's there's like I think there's now like just in Manhattan, ten million people, <laughs> and then in the boroughs, each one has a couple million each. So you're looking at like twenty some million people on the in tiny the island, boroughs yeah, of Manhattan, yeah. and yeah, and I, you know, we're that's the theater capital of the world, and I think that. Um, I don't know. Theater should be for everybody. Mm. It should be for all people, mm. not just some. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that I'm learning as well through Open Hydrant is that. You know, Broadway, you know, Broadway used to just be sort of like for gypsies and for, you know, it was a very, it wasn't like high, high class art. It was just, you know, we're kind of all the, the, the Broadway people. And then over the years, it's evolved into quite a, um, a an artistic sort of privileged place where, you know, it's expensive mm -hmm. and it's not cheap anymore. And so once last year was such a, was a, I think the biggest money it's ever made in billions last year. And so there's a whole class of people that are not at all included in that. Hmm. And so for me, it's wanting to try to bridge opportunity because so much of the charter school movement is about, you know, creating an opportunity for all. And I found that, you know, the dropout rates for high school students is so high. And then I found a sort of correlation with actors, that the dropout rate for actors was so high, actually higher in many ways. And in charter schools, we use data as our way to make decisions. And I thought, interesting, if we were to put that data into acting and into performance, is there data that tells us whether or not there are issues or problems? And it just seems so similar, so much of the, the charter school world and the acting world it just seemed to, to all make sense. And so yeah. I just decided since we've been able to be so successful with these charter schools, if we were to create a company that would follow this data, follow this idea, um, would it work? And hmm. we just did that. And that's how Open Hydrant became. We just decided to utilize all of the work we've already done with building successful charter schools hmm. and then just utilize it for a theater company. Oh, 
so great. Ten minutes in, and I feel like we've already accomplished <laughs> <laughs> the mission. You know, it's just exciting. I mean, and I want to draw a thorough line now for the audience, just so that you guys can kind of remember and see kind of where all of these connections take place of people that we've had on. Uh, Justin Horowitz, Jimmy Marino, Christian Guerrero, um, and I'm sure there's a couple others, but those three are kind of linked in with Foundation for New American Musicals, which I've mentioned on the show, which is exciting. Luis is also involved in all of that. Co-producers. Um, yeah. Co-producers mm -hmm. of, of Open Hydrant. Yes. Um, as well as Future Fest, which you're going to be seeing more of as we continue to talk about this and in the future. Uh, Future Fest, which is now in LA at Rockwell Table and Stage, and also in New York at the and Chicago and, coming soon. Oh, how exciting! Yes, is that the first time this has been said on yes. anything? Yes, we're working on. Just yes, <laughs> we te I teased Justin about that yes. on, in his episode because he teased something that hadn't been said or oh, something oh, like that. But um, and then yeah, New York in Fifty Four Below, which is the famous Broadway club. Um, how has Kind of what's the mission statement for that? Because I know it echoes Open Hydrant. And I know Open Hydrant as well has had many success stories as of recently with mm -hmm. students of yours that have now continued on into college and as well made it to Broadway or off-Broadway. Um, what was the mission behind starting Future Fest? Because Future Fest is such a similar entity. Yes. So Future Fest was born from Open Hydrant and the Festival of New American Musicals. So before I went to New York City, I was actually working here for five years in the charter school movements here in the San Fernando Valley. And so that's how I actually met Bob and Linda, who are the producers, executive producers of the foundation of New American Musicals. It was funny, I, was, I went to a meeting once, it was for a drama teachers association, and Bob and Linda just spoke to the entire Te the entire auditorium full of drama teachers and said, is anyone here interested in becoming part of the foundation? At that time it was a festival, but now mm -hmm. it's a foundation. But they were said, yeah, we do um, master classes with Stephen Sondheim and with um, very big Broadway, you know, royalty, uh, Stephen Schwartz, and anyone interested? And I just was amazed that everyone just sat there and didn't raise hands. Oh, come it, on. Everyone thinks it's, everyone, I think everyone yeah. thinks it's a scam or there's oh, some, sure. like, what? what's the catch? You know, you're saying, like, in two weeks I'll be sitting with Stephen Sondheim and we'll be, you know. And, of course, I just realized nobody was saying anything. So I, my partner and I, Rosie, were like, hey, we'll, we'll get involved, you know. So we got up and that's how we met Bob and Linda. We were the only ones, the only people in that entire auditorium. How many people in that, there? There Probably must hundreds. have been a couple hundred people. Wow. They are teachers. So we got up, met Bob and Linda, talked a bit about their mission and we talked about how we were serving the youth, diverse youth, low income, underserved students in our community. And they had already started a couple of programs at um, schools like in um, um, Compton and in uh, certain communities that did not have theater. And we just went back and forth and talked bit about how how can we bridge more opportunity for young adults for the future and that's how the festival came into sort of the conversation which was we must be able because I'm a strong believer about you've got to get out there and go hustle your way to get a career and I think hustle is misunderstood what people think of hustle I think they think like how can I use you get to get what I want and we're talking more hustle like get off your ass and go and do something mm -hmm. go to that meeting or go to that show or go to that place hustle you know and so we knew that there's no way that anyone's coming to your living room to give you a career you need to get out and do something and so we thought well then let's just make something where we're doing something and so we knew like I'd rather on a Saturday get come together at a theater with rising composers who are out there trying to tr you know make a, a a career trying to find ways to get their music and their shows out into the industry we have this amazing youth that are looking to try to figure out how to get their foot into the industry so why not bridge and bring those people together and create and so we decided to find composers that were from southern california and we asked you guys have music that you'd want to showcase on a saturday at a theater and they said yeah and then we had all these amazing talented kids that wanted to come together and do you want to sing new songs because i really believe in the new musical i really believe in the original musical i i'm happy that you know they do so many revivals but we really should be looking at the next generation of composers, like writers. And so I thought, what a great way to celebrate new 
new composers celebrate rising talent representing different schools, different cultures. And a lot of it was about my own students who were all poor, who did not have theater training, who did not have access to theater training, could not go see shows on Broadway, could not see shows at the Amund Center, the Pantages. And so why not then, how do I get them to meet rising youth and composers so this whole future fest seemed to make sense it seemed to be the perfect way to bridge what i was working on to bridge also rising youth come together celebrate and sing and then talk about the industry talk about what it means to try to have a career at this what it means to you know how do you get an agent how do you find a way to you know to to be to be seen out in the world um, and it seemed like the perfect day to have a festival, and that's how Future Fest was born. Bob and Linda from the foundation uh, agreed to produce with Open Hydrant to produce. And at that point, we weren't even a theater company yet. At that point, we are just Open Hydrant. We had the actual name, and we didn't know that we were going to be a theater company. And then we came together and created the first ever Future Fest, uh, which was um, something we, we did at Granada Hills High School. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, it was Kennedy High School. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and our first um, uh, guest speaker was um, one of the creators of Avenue Q mm -hmm. and spoke. And I thought that was also great to have someone who was working in the industry, a working professional to come speak with the youth. And uh, it was born and it just seemed to match this understanding of how do we build more opportunity authentically you know not just feeling like everyone i think thinks everyone deserves opportunity but we needed to really instead of talk about it let's just do it and show it and a big part of open hydrant is you know we don't believe in the word networking yeah you know, we just i just feel that's more about what can you do for me so we really talk about building relationships because that's what this industry is about. It's too small of an industry. You know, it really is small. People think it's, it's not. It's like everyone knows everyone. It's unbelievable how much, when you're really in it, how, how everyone knows everyone. So really you gotta start valuing the relationships that you're building. And I think that was what Future Fest also was about, was why not build those relationships now before everyone becomes super famous and allow yourselves to, um, you know, to, to support each other within production shows, work. And, um, and Future Fest was always about the future. It was always a festival and it was always about celebration of one's work and um, especially new composers. Ooh, man, that was a lot. And that, <laughs> not bad, not bad. I mean, like I, that just, I, again, we could just end the show right there, but that, uh, that is such a powerful and I don't know, that rings true to me because I'm all about that hustle. Mm -hmm. And I think the people I have on the show are about the hustle mm -hmm. and have been about the hustle. Yeah, and it's interesting and the word hustle crazy. because it's mis it's misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Hustling is an interesting word. And I think once you get it, you know, get it in the way that it's intended to be, you know, then you realize um, how much more uh, and on so many levels, especially when I think when you when you're trying to build a relationship and you're really trying to foster and cultivate that, because um, networking is a relationship, you know, and then it's it's just not what it, how we see it, you know, how Absolutely. we think it should be. It's um, it's deeper than that. Mm. It's because it, it should be deeper because if you're a good artist, you should want to reveal something deeply. You know, it, it's exactly. if you're truly trying to be high art. That that's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that to me, that's something that we we talk about every once in a while. Is uh, on the show is, you know, I think it's demonstrated. Actually, I'll say er, before every episode, and I definitely echo it. Um, everybody talks about how they got into the arts, and there's always, always a concrete reason, whether it's hardship. Mm -hmm. Or privilege, even the two ends of the spectrum, people still learn to cope with themselves through the arts if they're right brained yeah. and they're an artist, right? Yeah. I think even if you're not an artist, you still learn through the arts that you can be a confident version of yourself. And I think, you know, since my audience is a little younger, like my age and younger, I think people, it's good for people to hear affirmation about how, um, I don't know, 
maybe that it's okay to not know where you're going yet, but the hustle is key. That, that word that you said there is, is mm -hmm. very key. That's always in the back of my head. I'm very cerebral about how I approach what I do now because I've been learning that if I'm sitting back and just watching things happen or letting things happen, right? Because that's yeah. growing up. Your parents help you and, and all that stuff. But even if they can't, at some point, you do have to turn a corner and say, I'm going to do this for myself. I'm taking yeah. this for myself. And at the same time, learning how to then, you know, especially in theater, not only create your own shows, but support others. And it's a whole amazing community. Yeah. And small, like you said, I'm sure as you even get to the higher and higher levels, there's only four, five, six, seven, maybe blocks of Broadway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not as big as Hollywood. You know yeah. what I mean? And well, my mentor, my mentor told me that it's, um, think of it like a penthouse mm -hmm. and then there's an elevator that goes all the way down to the lobby and everyone's in the lobby, but only a few get in that penthouse and there, there's space in the elevator. Just who's in, who's in that elevator to go up to the penthouse and who did the penthouse send the elevator down for? Right. And I think that's important <laughs> for people to understand too, because they yeah. truly are most of the time, I'd say the ones that open it, open the door, you know, you know, uh, you know we had a kid that auditioned for, um, uh, the Wiz live. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because got to a callback and one of our really good friends was in the part of the casting and they got down to the three Dorothy's and, and you got to imagine when you're searching for talent, you're probably going to get down to three people who all could probably do it, who all probably are gifted on so many levels. If you go on a wide search, you're going to find mm -hmm. three girls that could all play. And each one's vying for this part. They're studying, they're learning, they're dancing, they're acting. And then at the end of the callback, they're going to excuse everyone out so they can make a decision. And it was interesting. He said that they didn't say who we given Dorothy to or who gets the part. They said, whose life are we changing today? And who are we ruining probably, right? <laughs> and I thought, yeah. you know, wow. that's really what it's about. It's truly about, it's not just your talent. It becomes you as a person, you know, who's earned this. And I guarantee they're going to probably Google you. <laughs> they're probably going yeah. to, you are know, they positive you know yeah, look, yeah. Uh, look you up. So on Instagram or, you know, whatever it is, but in the end, it's, it, it's not even about talent anymore. It, it's about your overall being, you know, and, and, and I just think that that is a, such a humongous part of also why Future Fest exists because we have to have, we have to start these conversations and that's what we do at Future Fest too, is not only have a celebration and a showcase of the talent and the songs, but we also talk. We also mm -hmm. discuss and and speak about, you know, we usually have a guest speaker, someone that is working and talks about the hustle and the struggle yeah. of being a working artist. I mean, that's the thing. It's also big is that it's not just about being an artist. It's about being a paid artist. And sometimes it's people don't want to talk about that for some reason as if it's, you know. Sacred. Maybe. Yeah, it's just, I mean, you've got to survive and you got to get but people like are afraid to bring up you know and i think you have to be able to talk about it because it, it it's these are real people you know and sometimes it's a dream and it's not you know it doesn't seem like it'd be real it, you know well now bouncing off of that because we talk about monetization a lot how to monetize yourself as an artist or in the arts at what point would you say you know how realistic do you have to be, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but how realistic do you have to be with yourself? Um, and how much do you have to listen to your mentors and people around you? You know, people who perceive the art that you make, especially in theater. How, how confident can you be in yourself? Like, how do you judge whether or not you should take that ne next step? Because I think a lot of kids in college, maybe, I don't know, graduating high school, college, they go to college, they go to NYU. And they're about to go into the cusp of acting. How do you know that you're ready? I know a lot of it's luck of the yeah, draw. Yeah, I would say that a big part is knowing, first off, what kind of artist or actor, I guess I'll talk about acting because that's what I, I work on. But what kind of actor do you want to be? You know, what, you know, I think that's the hardest 
part for an, an artist to come to terms with is like I like if I I'll, I'll use it utilize it when I talk to my kids about college, you know, someone that goes to College of the Canyons and is studying psychology, and someone that goes to Stanford studying psychology. Okay, who's working harder? Well, neither. I mean, they're just, they're both working harder. They're both working to try to learn psychology. Now, I don't know how is it richer at Stanford or, you know, or at the community call. Like, I don't, I mean, you know, algebra is algebra. Like, I, I don't know how it's better somewhere else, but Stanford is not College of the Canyons. So it's really about what you want and how you want to be represented and how you see it. It's not about how hard you work. And I think that's where it gets confused. Hmm. Yeah. Please flesh that out. You know, that people think it's, I have to work harder. It's like, Uh well, no, I don't think you can work harder to learn arithmetic. Like you just, Hmm. you know, one plus one is two and two plus two is four. But if you're going to go to college, well then, then why not go to Stanford? I mean, the biggest part, the biggest thing that we teach our kids in our company is that if you're going to do all this work to go to the Olympics, well, then how much more effort than to win the gold medal? Because if we're going to do all this work anyway, if we're going to go all this way, and I think people would just be happy. I went to the Olympics. And I re- to me, it's like, well, okay, but there's still a gold medal to win. And we work very, very in tune with our young artists in our company to understand that there's nothing wrong with just wanting to go to the Olympics, but the gold medal is what you really want to try to achieve. Mm. And so that plan, you know, going to Harvard is very different than just going to college. (laughs) So it's a plan you make already. You plan that prior and are willing to take all of the blows that come with that. And one of the big things that we teach our students is you know, to build a muscle, you have to rip it. Mm-hmm. You don't build muscle by just looking at weights. <laughs> you have to lift yeah. it and you got to rip it. And that's the part I don't think a lot of people can can bear. It's like, no, rip it, like rip. And people are like, and because that's how it heals to get bigger. And I don't think people want to get ripped. Hmm. I think they're trying to find, how do I get a better body without having to really lift the weights? <laughs> I like that analogy. Good analogy. And I think that's the problem is that you got to lift it. My love, like you, there's no other way around it. And, but it hurts. I know. And I think that for me, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just about wanting to have the highest level of success. And what does that really take? And the thing is everyone's saying now that, that just participating is success. And it's true. I, I, I agree. But I'm sorry, going to Stanford or Harvard is very different than going to the local community college. Oh, very different. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> true. 100% true. I, that's really interesting, that discussion about schools, because we talk, we've we talked about that with especially my peers that mm-hmm. are, have um, a couple of buddies of mine who have went to New York that I mentioned to you. Um, you know, that we talk about that. Like, it was it worth it? Do you really mm-hmm. think that you're learning a lot? Are you putting your time in? Or... Somebody like Stephen Whalen, who's the theater director of Valencia, Mm -hmm. uh, was chatting with me about, well, why don't you, you know, if you, maybe you don't need college, maybe what you need is to start auditioning right away. Now, this, again, could be one or the other, but you maybe need to start auditioning, ask your parents for $10,000 loan instead of $90,000 a year, (laughs) go get some good headshots and audition like crazy for a year then maybe go to school if it doesn't work out. Yeah, many of my students, we actually have them go to college but study business. Hmm. And that they should get business degrees because they're going to become a brand and they're going to become a business. And then you'll learn acting after. Hmm. And so I don't know how, I don't know. I, I feel I wish there was more business sense mm-hmm. in young mm-hmm. artists as mm-hmm. opposed to artistic sense yes you know it it understanding how to make a decision based on a business side and that's why i mean there's agents managers and people that can do all that for you but you yourself should really i think understand what that's about and so we're learning that many of our students get business degrees and then they learn acting afterwards or during maybe Mm -hmm. even right 
That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I mean, we talk about uh, a lot, you know, I keep saying we talk about a lot, but I talk about in my personal life mm-hmm. and think about how do I get better as a well-rounded artist? And I think you mentioned this at the beginning and I might segue into this now, you know, how do you, is it okay to try a million different things in the arts? And I, that to me is always a battle because I think this society pushes you one way. So you like all of these things pick one right and of course you have to monetize to be able to survive and maybe that's why they say pick one but at the same time you shouldn't feel pressured to just stay in film if you have the opportunity to then try theater or you know what i mean if you're being able to if you're working a steady job and making money still go and try the different things right yeah how about in your career like all of your time that you've spent in the arts most specifically in acting and stuff you mentioned that you like to wanted to try a bunch of different things at the beginning mm-hmm. how did you cope with that like do you still feel that it's a push pull no and- i knew it was theater I-, yeah. I knew that it was theater that i loved um i knew that um uh, one of my mentors looked at me and showed me put put up a piece of paper and said what is this and i said a rose Mm -hmm. and he's like yeah but it's not (laughs) and i'm like that's a rose he's like no it's something deeper and i'm like what and he said it's a photograph of a rose and i stood i just sat there for a second like okay and he's like so really when you're watching film or tv you're watching photographs you're not really watching live Mm -hmm. and then i said yeah i guess that's true and then this idea of you know having this intimate moment on a stage with an audience and there's just nothing like it and i knew that if you could do theater which was more shakespeare if you could do shakespeare and understood classics you could do anything because that was really the place where we could talk about the things that we couldn't talk about and i thought okay and so theater i knew always was the thing I wanted to be a part of and I knew was important for me to, um, to, 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 to explore. And I found that through my charter school work and working through, I mean, how it all began really for me was going into a Taco Bell and seeing one of my students serve me. And wow. <laughs> the first response I had was, what are you doing here? Now, in our time now, that's taken or could be taken as being insulting. You know, how dare you judge a fast food worker? And I'm thinking, what? Like, I'm just, what, you're, you, you are like Audra McDonald. You are one of the most gifted young artists I've ever worked with. Why aren't you on Broadway? Why aren't you performing? Was it, for it the wasn't masses? actually her, was it? No. No, no. And I'm just like, what, <laughs> like, why no. are you, yeah. what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah. And I realized that without having the resources, without having the money, without having the the hardships, that a life in the theater would be impossible for someone who didn't really have any sort of help. But in the end, it was, if she wants to work at Taco Bell, then she has the right to work at Taco Bell. I think she should own three Taco Bells is what I feel she should be doing. But I had to step away from that and go, okay, what's up? And that's really where Open Hydrant really began was seeing other students of mine who really should have pursued this as a profession and they would go to auditions and they would go to castings and because they are black or because they have a very specific sound that comes out of their mouth because they're from the Bronx. So there's a a New York twang Mm -hmm. that is involved when you come from a sort of very rich area and that they would walk into auditions and the casting directors who I really believe are doing their job, who I really believe are seeing the world the way the world is, is that when they would look at my students, they would think, you know, gang member or they would think cafeteria worker or jail scene. And so what's wrong with the casting director seeing that? You know, when I go to, I work at Stanford and when I go to the cafeteria, everyone serving me is black or Latino. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right now at this moment in the world and everyone sitting in the actual, you know, dining area is white. Mm-hmm. So it's not that I'm, it's just the way it is. And so a casting director, their job is to see the world the way the world is. And so when you watch one of my students walk in, you're just immediately thinking that, you know, they are playing, you know, gardener. Like this is, these are the things that, you know, come into play. And so I knew that, 
one of my students got really upset and quit acting because he paid all of this money to actually join a class. I mean, these are talking thousands of dollars to just study. And the acting teacher kept looking at him and said, look, stop trying to act. Like stop the, all the big, just, just say the lines truthfully. Like say the lines honestly. Stop giving the, some, the pizzazz to it. Just simply say it truthfully. So then you do, you say the line truthfully. And because of where you come from and how you look and how you sound, you're right back at gang members you're right back mm. at prison scene because that's your truth that's how you come off and so in the end you're doing the right thing but you're wrong huh and you have to then balance what are the steps i take next to try to figure out my path to a career and that's where open hydrant started because i knew that you're going to have to start realizing that characters speak in different ways than you speak and characters see the world different ways than you see the world. And what I see right now with Latinos and black actors is that we're cultivating their honesty. All these amazing organizations that have all the millions of dollars in the world to offer programs, federal programs to the underserved, they're yeah. just really allowing the actors, the artists, the young youth of color to just blossom by finding themselves. And so they're learning acting through just finding their truth. Mm. But then if their truth is limiting them professionally, then why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we discussing it? And so that's why New Open Hydrant wasn't going to be that kind of organization where we would just cultivate. We would first call, we call find their authentic self. Yeah. And then, then what? And that's what Open Hydrant's about. It's about realizing that it, and it's more coming from the British because I'm seeing a lot of British black actors take on all of these American roles. Hmm. And I got to wonder what that's about, you know, because I was just talking to a friend of mine about uh, the movie Get Out. Mm -hmm. And here's an amazing film that I, I mean, it's made like $400 million worldwide. It's it was beautiful. a $5 million film. And Jordan Peele, who's from the, 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 the Harlem, who comes from the community, comes from the hood in New York City, is someone that if there was anyone that was going to give a young black actor of Amer a, a young black actor from America a chance, it would have been Jordan Peele. Jordan. I mean, he would have been the guy yeah. that because he came from this place, and so you go on this you know worldwide casting, and in the end, you know Lionsgate gave him five million dollars to direct a film, and he's obligated to make the best film he possibly can make it's not about favors it's about i have to make a film that is the best and so in the end he casts daniel kalua who is a british black actor so he casts a british actor to play an american when there are just how many american black actors in our huh and so that's you, that's really interesting so you realize that yeah he cast the best person for the part. Yeah. Someone that can change their entire speaking pattern and make you believe they're American. Good luck competing against that actor. Oh my gosh. And he's amazing. Just that way. good yeah. luck. <laughs> There's something that Daniel Kalua is doing that Tay Diggs is not doing. Oh yeah. And Clearly. I love Tay Diggs. Yeah. I'm a redhead. Yeah. I love yeah. him. <laughs> love him on yeah. so many levels, but mm -hmm. He's not even, you know, changing your whole speaking pattern, your whole physicality to play a part. That's a whole, that's other level stuff. And I think that's truly something to talk about because I'm not seeing a lot of Latino and, and black American actors doing that kind of work. Yep. And what's that about? Like, why? Mm. You know, and I, and I have to think about it. So Open Hydrant's really more about opening the discussion about that talking about why we're not just looking at character work why are we thinking that characters are us yeah you know hmm. it's got to be more than that so idris elba you look at you know someone who comes in and is starting to understand how to you know portray a character and i don't know i just i'm and, it, and you start the conversations with people and of course it's instant arguments you know because we're in a world where we just people don't want to talk about things they get mad so fast because it's such a beautiful thing just to work. Yeah. It's such a beautiful thing to, you know, it, I, I love the fact that one of my students would be on a show, The Vampire Diaries. It would be so wonderful and incredible, right? But it's not Breaking Bad. No. But people think it is. Hmm. 
they just think it's a TV show. But there's something deeper and richer and content's different. Con- I mean, yeah, way different. <laughs> but they're Not both great. Like they're both yeah. great. But so is the community college and Stanford. Mm-hmm. There, it's not just about college. Like, and yeah. we're not able to have these richer conversations for some reason still, because it would in somehow be saying that someone's lesser than or yeah. something. And it's not about that, but you know, and that's why open hydrant exists as well. And future fest is to allow ourselves to meet people who are wanting to have that conversation that want to talk about it in a deeper, richer way, as opposed to just simply, Oh, we're doing a festival. We're singing. It's not about that. That song has something really deep to say. There's something truly about what's going on. That composer has composed something because there's something he wants, you know, uh, you know, I just, I was just in New York and had the opportunity to uh, perform for Stephen Sondheim for 10 minutes just face to face with Sondheim in this opera we did we had this immersive opera in New York Mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago that we were blessed to be a part of and I just realized wow when would I ever be able to say that I performed for Stephen Sondheim and I really thought about Stephen Sondheim a lot because he's very verbal about his techniques and the way that he goes about things and there's a couple of documentaries about him but there's something he was saying he was having an interview with a uh, a writer who had said, your songs are so poetic. And he stopped the writer so fast. He says, no, 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 don't. Poems are very different than musical theater songs. They're not the same. No. And no. the writer's like, well, explain. He's like, well, the poem, once you read it, you can go back and read it again. And you can go back and read it again. And then read mm. it again and then try to grasp the, the depth of meaning in a musical theater song you get only once that's it so you can't write it the same way it's mm. a different kind of writing because if it goes over the, the audience's head you're done mm. you only have that one chance to get them to follow it as they move on in the story and so they're not poems they're something very different. They're musical theater songs. And so this real sort of understanding of what it really means, you know, there's a, he also had a documentary about the show company, which is now in London yep. playing yep. with Pay Lapone. Yep. They, they changed the sexes, but there's a whole documentary about the making of the 1970 version. And there's a section where she's singing the song and he's like, there's a section there you're singing and you're singing a B. She's like, yeah. He's like, I wrote a B flat. And she's like, okay. He's like, so sing the B flat, not the B. <laughs> and you're like, so particular. Yeah. What but, the it's, heck? but a B flat's not a B. No, you're it's like, very it's, different. You know what I mean? It's just. Totally different tone. But we're in a world now where I think yeah. people think a B is a B flat. It's wow. just it's just a note. I love the parallels you're drawing. Because you've you done know? it three three at least three different times, different examples. That's so That's so interesting. That's why I think what you're doing with Open Hydrant and, and everything is so valuable. Um, and as we kind of bring it into a landing, you wouldn't believe we're all already at 40 minutes. Oh my but gosh. Goes by quick, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like we probably could talk for a long time, but, um, with all that being said, I want to give you kind of a last second little teaser, um, to camera, if you'd like to just kind of to your audience and to my audience, what do you got coming up, uh, for open hydrant slash future fest and all that stuff. And you can just go right into this camera as long as you like. Well, hello. Um, so Open Hydrant Theater Company, which is the first professional equity theater company in the South Bronx. We are um, an ensemble based group. So please check us out. Openhydrant.org, thepoint.org. We are currently doing West Side Story with our youth. And next is Rent. And we also just produced In the Heights. And we are um, building a very musical theater oriented group, theater oriented group. So please, please, please check us out. Uh, We also upcoming, we've just partnered with TDF, which is the Theater Development Fund. And we are creating a cohort of theater going audiences to come and see theater, uh, Broadway, off Broadway. So if you're interested, uh, you know, shout out to us. And Future Fest, we are doing Future Fest this January, uh, the it's the second Tuesday of January. I don't know the date exactly at Rockwell Table and Stage. And then on April 2nd, we do Future Fest in New York City at 54 Below. 
So check us out there. If you're interested and want to maybe take part or be a singer or you're a composer for Future Fest, then shout out. Uh, you can email us at info at openhydrant.org. Wonderful. Well, it's been awesome to have you on. <laughs> I'm sure we'll do a fair amount of talking after the <laughs> show closes. <laughs> but um, it's so neat to have another person on, another adult, you know, relatively older than us on to talk about things that matter and realizing directionally that there's a way to get where you want to go if you work hard enough. Not necessarily, but you know what I mean. Um, just the fact that you have the hustle and want to keep going. Um, that's what this is about, you guys. I'm really thankful that you keep tuning in. It's actually been growing a good amount. We're excited that uh, we're in touch with some really neat people that continue to push this whole theme forward and uh you know i was just watching or listening the other day to a couple different podcasts just because i always want to stay current and hear different people and there's so many people who you know they'll do business pods and, and i think the business podcasts are good because they help you know acclimate you to industry and all that but i started realizing that most podcasts just don't air toward professionalism not saying ours does, but I'm saying a lot of people, I think this goes with your point. A lot of people nowadays aren't seeking to create things that matter necessarily. I think that's a whole thing that Luis is saying um, today on the episode. And uh, that's what we stand for. And I know that you've seen me even do the solo episode and Chris was on it with me and we were t just talking about just how necessary it is to be able to feel okay with where you're at and talk about deep things because this world more and more doesn't want to talk about them. Kind of like what we've been talking about today. So please feel encouraged to share today with uh, somebody in your small circle. Feel okay to, you know, dig up those deep things that are bothering you because you'll never get over them if you don't talk about them. So talk about them. Talk about your art with other people. Collaborate with other people. Collaboration is something we didn't really talk about, but that is something that is so huge to your growth as an artist because if you stay so small in one category, you're never going to move out and you know and broaden your horizons. So all that to, all that to be said, uh, follow along with us, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 1 in 20 show. Um, you may notice too, like this is a total aside, but I'm not wearing a black or white shirt this time. I'm realizing that we're kind of starting to take this in new directions and I just want to be more of a version of myself. I don't know. I don't want to, I just don't want to put on an outfit that is the same every time. <laughs> I don't know. That's just an aside, but, um, lots of fun things coming. We're actually going on the road for a few episodes coming up. You're going to be very excited. <laughs> with some of the things that we've been working on and um, some really good stuff coming down the pipe. And uh, we're really excited. Thankful for you, Luis. Thank you for being Thank on today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Been a lot of encouraging things that we've chatted about. And that's awesome. So thank you guys for watching. We'll be back soon with another episode.